Hi everyone, this is Susan Riley from Education Closet. I am so excited that you have joined us tonight. We have an incredible session coming up with um, two fabulous educators, um, and it's such a unique pairing. We have Lisa Stewart, who is an art educator, and Jenny Klein, who is currently a reading specialist. And the two of them have written this fantastic new book about art and reading comprehension strategies. And so tonight, um, I am going to kind of fade in the background, which is perfect. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to both of my colleagues over there, um, and they're going to be talking about their new book and providing you with these incredible strategies. So for the next 45 minutes or so, you are going to be in depth with art and reading strategies. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa and Jenny. Hi. 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 All right. Well, come on in and just get us started, ladies. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Lisa Stewart, and um, I uh, am currently the visual arts supervisor for Prince George's County Public Schools. Uh, I just started my job two weeks ago, um, so I'm really excited to be there. Um, and you're going to hear a little bit about my background and where I came from before that. Um, and then... And I'm Jenny Klein, and I'm a reading specialist at Burning Tree Elementary School, and that is in Montgomery County. And we, as Lisa said, we'll be talking a little bit about how we met in our backgrounds in a few minutes. Okay, great. So we're going to go over to our presentation now. Okay, so um, we have uh, written a book together called Using Art to Teach Reading Comprehension Strategies, and I think as part of your packet for um, this webinar, you're going to get a special uh, uh, code to be able to um, go on to the Roman and Littlefield website and get a discount off our book. Um, so a little bit of information about our book. Um, we are the two authors. Uh, it was released in January of 2013, so it's pretty new. Um, it is published by Roman and Littlefield and co-published by the NAEA. Um, we gave you the ISBN number and you can order it on Amazon um, and the NAEA website and Roman and Littlefield, but today we have a special code for you to be able to order it through uh, Roman and Littlefield. So the purpose of tonight's webinar is that we are going to be looking at the connection that we have between reading and art. Um, in art, we use what the artist gives us and we think on our own to create meaning. And in reading, we use what the author gives us and we think on our own to create meaning. And we believe that art really provides the scaffolding that children need to move from a text-free environment in the art world to a text environment in the reading world. And so the premise of our book really is that um, we have discovered that when we teach um, students reading comprehension strategies through art first in a text-free environment, they really are able to understand it and not get so hung up on the actual words and text um, and are able to understand the strategy and then transfer it to the world of text. So the layout of our book is we have six chapters. Um, chapter one is making connections, que then we go to questioning, visualizing, which is what we're going to be working on tonight, uh, inferring, determining importance, and synthesis. Um, and each chapter of our book includes an overview, lesson plans in art and reading, handouts, reflections, and resources. And you'll be able to see that if you um, purchase the book. This one. Okay, so here are the strategies that Lisa just talked about. And visualizing is in red because that's the one that we're going to be talking to you about tonight. So we want to give you a little bit of a history about our project. Lisa and I met at Tacoma Park Elementary School 
where she was the art teacher and I was the um, gifted and talented teacher and the reading specialist. And we came together there to work on our project. Um, at the time, the school was focusing on reading comprehension strategies. And Lisa had two half an hour blocks per week in her schedule. And the principal asked her if she could work with us to develop some um, art and reading comprehension lessons together for the students. Now, Tacoma Park was a K-2 school, so we had kindergarten through second graders. So Lisa was able to rotate the children through the classes, and we focused on first and second grade. Um, we also had book clubs at our school, and we were focusing on two books, Mosaic of Thought and Strategies That Work. So we would come together with our teams, which were large since we were the primary school, and we would discuss the strategies and what it meant to visualize and what it meant to determine importance. And we focused on the different strategies. And then we developed the lessons together at Tacoma Park Elementary. And so Lisa would teach the lessons in the art classroom, and then we would go into the reading language arts classroom, and we would teach the lesson again in the reading language arts classroom. Yeah, and this was really nice because um, at Tacoma, I was able to teach all my regular art classes um, throughout the week and teach my art curriculum. And then um, I still had pl enough planning time, but I, I happened to actually have extra planning time. And so because we had this school-wide focus on reading comprehension, the principal asked if I could work with the team to create these uh, reading and reading infused art lessons and so it worked out really nicely um, to have these kind of 30 minute blocks where all the students came a few times a year I didn't see them you know on a on a regular basis but I saw them three or four times a year each uh, to be able to teach these kind of extra lessons for them so it was really nice and so then Lisa moved to Cloverly Elementary School and I moved to Sherwood Elementary School and the nice thing about that was we were still really close. So we really liked to collaborate. We continued our collaboration. And I had a principal who also really liked, you know, seeing his teachers doing a lot of collaborative work. And he believed in the project. So I had some release time that I'd go over and work with students in Lisa's room. And then at Sherwood Elementary School, we came together and did a summer camp and worked with students there. So we want to talk a little bit about reading structures. I know some of you may have a reading background, and um, you know some of you may not. So the interesting to think about, the interesting thing to think about when you think about reading are kind of the surface structures of reading and the deep structures of reading. And when we talk about the surface structures of reading, that's when children are learning how to read. And we focus on certain strategies, as you can see up on the screen there, when we're teaching children the surface structures using context to figure out meanings, decoding strategies, cross-checking, seeing if what they're saying looks right, sounds right, makes sense. And so those are all the surface structures of reading. When children are learning about words, and they're learning about language structure, and they're learning about um, sentence structure at a text level. And then you have the deep structure strategies of reading. And these are the instructional strategies that we focused on um, in our work together. And the deep structures is all about comprehension. Um, word meanings, constructing meaning at the text level, um, social construction of meaning, and to get children to develop these, the deep structure strategies, um, we focus on, as we said before, the different comprehension strategies. Monitoring for meaning, using relevant prior knowledge or background knowledge, determining importance, questioning, visualizing, inferring and synthesizing. So um, we did do some research and what we found at the time was that strategies really need to be taught through explicit instruction, that teacher directed instruction really needs to be done not just with those surface structures for young children but also in the comprehension strategies as well and that the reader needs to construct meaning through the integration of what they already know and what they are learning and one of the big points was that also children can begin making inferences and can begin that comprehension at the very beginning, not just after the literal comprehension is mastered. And Fielding and per Pearson also said that 
the successful program should be teacher directed, that children should have occasions to talk to a teacher and to one another, and that there needs to be opportunities for peer and collaborative learning. So when we planned the lesson, we did you know, we used the explicit model of instruction for teaching the strategy where we modeled it. We gave children time to have guided practice, independent practice, and then work on their own. We did a lot of um, partnering so students could work together, and um, a lot of peer and collaborative learning opportunities were built into our lessons. So just um, to keep in mind some of the connections to the Common Core Literacy Anchor Standards, we put this slide in here. So um, our lessons focus and connect on the key ideas and details and the craft and structure. And also the range of reading and level of text complexity, as you can see, you can differentiate with the students on the text they use and also with the artwork that they use for the lessons. Okay, so now we're going to start um, talking about our uh, visualizing uh, chapter. And we're going to walk you through some of the activities in that. Um, so for our pre-activity, what we would like you to do is trust us and just close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> And what we would like you to do is to be thinking about a place that you like to visit to relax or have fun. And for just about 30 seconds, we want you to visualize that place in your mind and be thinking and creating a mental picture about what do you see, are there any smells, are there any sounds. So we'll give you about 30 seconds to just Visualize that place in your mind. Okay, so we gave you this really nice picture here um, of the beach and the sand. Um, and usually when we do a face-to-face -face, uh, presentation, we ask that people kind of share a little bit of some of the places that they visualized. Um, and some of our participants tell us that they visualize maybe a cabin in the woods that they go and they visit and they hear birds and they hear the trees uh, rustling as, they, as the wind goes through them. And so... Um, we have a really nice kind of way of bringing this alive for children right in the beginning by having them just kind of create a little bit of a mental picture of a place that they've already been to before. Um, so this gets students um, ready to do our visualizing activity. So we're going to talk about the strategy now of visualizing and we're going to do a visualizing activity. Um, and here we have a little bit of student artwork that we've done uh, with students before. Um, and Jenny, do you want to share a little bit about um, your coach? Sure. So the interesting thing about the strategy of visualizing is uh, if you think on your own when you might use it yourself. And what Lisa's referring to is that I had um, a hockey captain, actually, um, on a ho ice hockey team. I played ice hockey. Um, when I was younger, and she would always talk to her teammates about visualizing, you know, going down the ice with the puck, going around a person with the puck, scoring the goal, and to really have these mental pictures of yourself doing this before you um, go and play a game. Um, and for some people, that was new to them. So, you know, you might think on your own, how do you visualize? Um, when, when are you doing it? I know a lot of you probably do it while you're reading. But where else do you use visualization? Uh, Lisa and I presented at NAEA once, and we had a participant in our section say that this was something was, that was really difficult for her, that she didn't use this strategy. So I think when we're, we're thinking of young children or, or any age children um, or, or our students, we have to think about, you know, are they using this strategy? and how are they using it, and when are they using it, and how can they strengthen their use of this strategy. 
Okay, so our art and visualizing lesson that we're going to walk you through, I'm just going to review the mastery objectives with you for this. And again, these are um, posted in our book and in the um, e-guide that you'll be getting as part of this uh, resource guide that you'll be getting as part of this webinar. Um, so students uh, in this lesson will be working with partners to verbally describe a work of art while their partner visualizes a mental picture and then draws it. And so this activity with students takes about a, a 45 minute session um, and uh, we have also posted essential questions um, in our book as well. How can creating visual images in our mind help us to better understand a work of art? And then we also have several art vocabulary words that we'll be using throughout this lesson as well. Um, in this lesson, the materials that you'll need are a large reproduction of artwork. Um, you can have that either physically as a poster or be projecting it onto uh, a board using an LCD projector or a Promethean board or some sort of interactive whiteboard, chart paper, um, a quick sketch template that we uh, provide in our book, but today uh, we'll just use any um, piece of paper, white paper that you have sitting around. Um, sets of two different prints, and we'll talk to you about what that is in a minute for each pair of students. Um, manila folders. Uh, sometimes um, we have students that put these up as kind of um, privacy folders so that their partner that they're describing the work to can't see um, the work of art. Uh, 30 plastic chips, and we'll talk to you about what we use that for. And then various drawing materials. And then um, sometimes for students, especially young ones, we really like to post the elements of art and principles of design vocabulary uh, chart on their table or workstation so that they have those words to refer to as they're describing the work of art. Um, and we list those and definitions in our book as well. So first we start by modeling. We usually start all of our lessons by modeling and um, in this situation um, when we worked in the classroom together, Jenny and I were able to team teach our lessons, so we were able to do our modeling together, but if you don't have another teacher to do the modeling with, you can just pull a student from your class and ask them to do the modeling with you. And so um, in this situation, we would have a teacher A and a teacher B, and teacher B will have not seen the print. Teacher A can show the print um, to the class so the class can see it. Um, and then teacher B is going to be the one that's doing the drawing. So teacher A is going to describe the print to the second teacher and then teacher B is going to visualize that print in their mind and create a mental picture and then record their thinking using a, the quick sketch technique. So what we want uh, uh, students to do and what we want to model here is that we don't want this to be like a complete finished work of art. It's really meant to um, be, have students kind of sketch out their ideas pretty quickly. Um, and you'll see an example of that uh, next. So um, then at the very end, then the teacher can take a look and see um, and compare their work to the original one. So we have a description that we're going to read to you and have you all kind of follow along with us as we show you this modeling. And then you're going to get an opportunity to do this for yourself. So Jenny's going to go ahead and read this description to you. And while she's reading it, go ahead and visualize what this work of art looks like in your mind. So this is a print of a mother and child walking down a path in the middle of a field. The artist used secondary and warm colors in the painting. In the foreground, there are grasses on the left side of the path and cabbage-like plants on the right side. The woman and small child are the focal point of the painting. They are in the foreground. The woman is carrying a basket in each hand, and the child is walking in front of her. In the middle ground, there is a line of trees. Behind the trees in the background, there are hills, and above the hills, the sky is filled with puffy clouds. 
Okay, so hopefully all of you created a little mental picture of what that looks like. And so now I want to show you an example of my quick sketch drawing. Now, don't judge my artistic <laughs> technique on this one. I really was drawing very quickly. This took me um, a minute or two to do. And so um, that is what you know we're encouraging, that this isn't really like a full, final, finished piece of work. So here's my very quick teacher sketch that I would the students would watch me do. Um, so, you know, think about how this compares to the mental picture that you created. And then here is the final work of art. So, you can see here that there is a little bit of difference between the description to the um, sketch that I drew to the final work of art. Um, and. And I think, too, just to, to add to that is. The children, you know, seeing their art teacher do the quick sketch and mm -hmm. it really frees them up to use that technique for their own drawing too. Yeah. So this is another example of a work of art that we have used um, for this and we're going to show you even more examples later. Um, but when you're choosing a work of art for this uh, lesson, you really want to choose something that's not um, too abstract choose something that's a little realistic, something that the students may have actually had a little bit of experience with so that they can kind of pull on their background knowledge to visualize that in their mind. Um, if you pick something that's like really crazy and abstract, uh, this, it, it'll be too difficult for students to, to visualize that. Um, so now... Oh, well, I was just going to say, do we need to give people time to get materials they don't already have them or they, hopefully they should hopefully okay. they should have uh, a piece of paper if you don't just you know pull out a piece of paper that you have sitting near you um, and a pencil or pen or whatever you've got um, if you have some colored pencils or oil pastels that would be great too so uh, what we're going to do now is you are going to get a chance to visualize a print that I'm going to um, describe to you and you're going to draw it very quickly. We'll give you about two minutes to do that, two to three minutes to do that. And I'm going to actually read it to you twice. I think that it really helps that um, you have a chance to first just sit and, uh, and absorb the words and soak them in and create that mental picture. And then um, to kind of go back and draw and I can um, describe it to you twice so that you can be drawing at the same time as I'm describing again. Okay, so hopefully you all are ready, um, and I'm going to show you the print a little later, so right now you're just going to be visualizing. So go ahead and close your eyes if you want to, or you know whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, so this is a work of art um, that is on a sandy beach. Um, there is an ocean in the background far off uh, into the distance. Um, about three quarters of the page is beach and one quarter of the page and maybe even a little less than that is the ocean. Um, and it is a beautiful blue ocean um, and there is a horizon line that is very close to the top of um, the page and there are some distant sailboats way off in the horizon, two actually. Uh, one is a little bit bigger than the other. And then it looks like, it's really vague, but it looks like there might even be someone off in the distance in a boat rowing. Um, in the foreground, in the front of the work of art, there are two little girls. They look like they're about maybe two years old. Um, one is facing the viewer and the other one is turned slightly away, kind of like she's facing back where the ocean is. Um, and they both have um, buckets in their hands and they're digging in the sand and the, the little girl that's facing the viewer has the bucket in between her legs and she is um, taking her shovel and putting it into the bucket. Um, and looking like she's either pouring in some sand or taking out some sand. Um, they are wearing beautiful dresses on the beach. They're definitely not in their beach uh, 
um, swimsuits like you would see today. <laughs> They're in these gorgeous uh, dresses with like a white smock on top. Um, and uh, the little girl in the that's be that's behind that's kind of looking at the ocean um, has stockings on and um, the little girl in the foreground um, doesn't have anything on her legs and they both have or the, the little girl in the foreground has shoes on and red socks and she's looking down at her bucket okay so now that you have kind of created that mental picture I'm gonna go ahead and say it again um, I'm gonna say it a little bit faster this time because I want to make sure that we also make it to the reading lesson as well um, and so you can be drawing why, why I say it again. So again, uh, this time get out your materials and, and start your drawing and hopefully you already have. So three quarters of the page again is sand and about one quarter on the top. Uh, what I didn't say before is that this um, work of art is uh, it's horizontal. And, I'm sorry, it's vertical and not horizontal. So if you haven't turned your page, I guess you could turn that now. But um, so three quarters of the page is sand, and one quarter is uh, the sky. I'm sorry, the ocean, and then the, a little bit of the sky. And um, think about those boats in the background, and the man rowing or woman rowing in the ocean, and then the two little girls, and um, one in the facing the viewer, looking down at her bucket, digging into the sand in her bucket, uh, wearing her dress and her smock. Her dress is blue and then she has this white smock, but you can only see like the rim of blue on her arm um, and then a little bit on the bottom of her outfit. Um, what I didn't say before is that the little girl that's facing uh, the ocean um, is wearing this um, yellow hat with a bright red ribbon around the outside of it. Um, so you can add that as well. Okay, I hope that you have a little bit of a description of what's going on. What we'd love for you to do at some point is post this on a Padlet page and I'm going to give you that URL in a minute um, and we'll talk about how you can actually do that to share some of the artwork that you've created. Um, so I'll give you about 30 seconds to finish up your work of art, and then I'm going to show you, I'll reveal the picture. Okay, hope you're ready. So, this is the work of art. It is a Mary Cassatt. Um, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, it's one of my favorite. I love Mary Cassatt. I think she's an amazing painter. Um, so a few things to note here that you may have some questions on is um, remember that it's not really important that this looks just like the artwork. It's really just your interpretation of what you visualize. So if yours looks a little bit different, you know, it's really okay. It, it really is all in how I interpreted the work as I was uh, describing it to you and then how you visualized it and then created it. Um, so you have to really think about how it's just as important for the person to describe the work using their art vocabulary and I hope you notice some of the art vocabulary that I use tonight. Um, it's just as important for the person describing it as it is for the person who's drawing it. So, so therefore language is a really important factor here um, and building those art vocabulary words is important. Um, it's really not about a step-by-step -step following directions. It's not about put this here. Okay, next we're gonna put the sun in the left-hand corner and put the, you know, put the ocean, you know, here and put the bucket here. It's really having you kind of create that mental picture and then you drawing it. Um, and then think about this as kind of the game of telephone. So. You know, if you ever play the game of telephone before, somebody has to start with a message and then as it kind of goes down the line, it gets kind of reinterpreted and then when it comes out at the end, it's very different than it started. So um, this is kind of the same thing. You have a student who is uh, looking at the work, interpreting it into words, putting it into words, translating that to uh, someone. You're visualizing it 
creating that mental picture and then you're drawing it. So it's kind of like the game of telephone where it changes a little bit as it goes um, throughout. Now what I didn't talk to you about was those 30 plastic chips that we talked about before. Usually what we have students do now is trade and so um, each person will get an opportunity to go through this activity. But since we're doing this kind of uh, webinar style, um, <laughs> Uh, we aren't able to do that tonight. But the plastic chips are really for students kind of as a game for them to ask clarifying questions. So to the person who is describing the work of art, I as the artist could cash in a plastic chip and say, tell me a little bit more about the colors in the sand. You know, what kind of colors should I use there? Um, and so they're able to kind of ask clarifying questions. We came up with three just because we didn't want there to be like 30 clarifying questions, um, so we thought three was a nice number. So you can provide some plastic chips as kind of a, a game for them to cash in on some questions. So here are some of the art vocabulary words that you might want to emphasize and work on uh, for this lesson. Um, and then these are some other examples that we've used before um, with students. And you can see that they differ in their level of complexity. Um, so, you know, we have something very simple as a still life with apples, and then we get a little bit more complex, like um, Vincent van Gogh's bedroom, where there's a lot of items and a lot to draw, and you kind of bring in perspective, which gets more complicated. And so um, you can differentiate using the works of art that you choose to use with students. You might choose something a little bit more simpler as you do this for the first time, and then if you're going to repeat it, you could um, get more complicated with your works of art, or you can do simpler work with kindergartners and more difficult work with high school students. It really just depends um, on your student's level of ability. So now we're going to take a virtual gallery walk. Um, and what we'd really like you to do, you don't have to do this right now, but at some point um, tonight or tomorrow or the next few days, what we'd love for you to do is just take a quick shot of your sketch and post it on our Padlet site. Um, so I can go to that really quick. So you can take a look. Hi. So this is our Padlet site. Oh, not yet. This is our Padlet site, and what you do is you using using the link that um, we provided in the packet. You just double click. You can add your name, post a title for your work, or you know whatever you want to tell us about it. You can even write something, and then you can upload a file right here and share a, uh, your drawing that you did. And so this will be our virtual gallery walk that we'll be doing. Um, so feel free to add your drawing to our Padlet site, and we'll leave that up. Uh, I, I, we won't take that down, so that can just stay up forever. Okay. Hi. <laughs> All right. So, Susan, at this point, are there any burning questions before we move on to reading? Sorry, I can't, we can't hear you. Hold on one second. Wait. Oh, there we go. I think I just took myself off mute. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, Kim just asked, uh, will we see examples of what some of the K2 students created at your schools? Um, in our book, I don't know that we have a whole lot of um, photographs because we had to get permission from students um, so there there aren't a whole lot of examples we have done a lot of workshops and we do have some teacher examples and we're working on trying to get some of those um, up on our website at some point um, but yeah at this moment uh, no we don't really have a whole lot of examples but I would love I think we would love to um, you know, if, if that's something that people would love to share with us, we would love to see some examples of things that your students have done as they've done this um, activity. Perfect. So then there's another question about um, 
the process of the, the description. Is there a method for um, creating or writing the description? Is there certain vocabulary you definitely need to use? Is there a, a way, do you start with the foreground or the, or the background? How do you craft that description? Sure. Um, we, we talk a lot about this in our workshops and what a great question. Um, first of all, it really depends on your students and you know you as their teacher will know what their needs are but um, you know giving them a model like we did at the very beginning um, is, is a really important thing to do um, one of the things that we have talked about depending on what prints you have you can look at it yourself and give them kind of key vocabulary that would go with that print that they could use so they could you know develop their description based on that and you know I think the first time you do it you know, telling them maybe to start in the, the foreground or telling them to start in the background is, you know, giving them guidance um, is important too if they haven't had a lot of experience doing this. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, using the vocabulary cards, um, using your, the, the, you know, doing the model yourself and then, you know, training them to talk about the print in a certain way would be very helpful. Um, you can see just by that this um, and I think Lisa mentioned this before that this activity really has a lot of language there mm -hmm. um, It builds on language so if your children need support then you know go ahead and put those supports in for your children Which actually takes me to my the last question before we keep going with your presentation so what about for um, ELL students or special education population that may not have that kind of robust vocabulary does this First of all, does this encourage or does it build that or do you ever find that to be a stumbling block in using this kind of a method? Well, that's a great question and I think the, the first step there is to look at the art you choose. Like still lifes would be really good. Simpler paintings so that, you know, and maybe with them also using language frames so that you could kind of model how they could talk about a print. Um, maybe you want to pick one artist and so then you mo model using that one artist's work and then they'll have another similar piece by the artist where then they could apply what they saw you do. But using language frames, giving the vocabulary and you could kind of see the difference between my description of the print that Lisa did and her description for the one that she did. Um, it was simpler. You know, some, we've also talked with um, people about giving time, like we went right into it, where you know you look at the print and then you describe it to you, to your partner right away. But maybe one day all you do is have your child look at the print and decide what they're going to say about it, and that's enough for one day, using the, the you know supports that you give them. But it definitely can be used for ELL, and you can see how. Um, much language that they, that they they could develop through an activity like this. Perfect. Okay. Keep going, ladies. <laughs> All right. So, back to our... Okay. So, we did questions. So, now we're going to go into the reading language arts lesson. Okay, so we have a mastery objective for the reading language arts lesson. So this would be the lesson that we would then go back into the reading classroom and do. So students will apply the strategy of visualizing by creating illustrations that depict the visual images that they have in their minds while listening to a poem. It will take about one 45-minute session. So the materials that you'll need are descriptive phrases, three poems of different length difficulty copied onto chart paper because we want to differentiate the poetry like we did with the artwork, paper for modeling, and paper for the students' illustrations and art materials like pencils, crayons, and erasers. So what you want to do first is to model by showing what you would think of in your mind and making your thinking visible by reading a few descriptive phrases such as the flowers were bending in the wind, the butterfly floats across the tops of the flowers and you would do a quick sketch of the phrase and think aloud about what you were looking at or what you were seeing as you were reading listening to the phrase. Um, then you'll have your independent partner work time 
where you can give students phrases and they'll use the quick sketch again to record their visual images of the phrases. And then they'll share their quick sketches with a partner. So um, what we're going to do in a few minutes is show you some phrases that you can choose from and go ahead and read the phrase of your choice, visualize that in your mind, and then do your quick sketch of that phrase. And uh, as Lisa showed you, you can also um, post yours on the Padlet page. So here are the phrases. Uh, we have one by Joni Mitchell from one of her songs, The Sun Poured In Like Butterscotch and Stuck to All My Senses. The J.K. Rowling, one by Lisa Mertens, and then a student example. So you can go ahead and read them and choose the one that you'd like to do a quick sketch of. And we'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Okay, so um, we know you might have gotten a quick sketch done, um, and you can go ahead and post those to Padlet. Um, I think the interesting point here, kind of what Lisa was also saying about the when you're visualizing the artwork, is that you don't have to draw necessarily literally about what you're seeing. It's whatever is coming to your mind, because the whole purpose of this visualizing is making meaning out of something. So it's either, you know, making meaning out of, um, well, making meaning out of text, making meaning out of this phrase, and, and sometimes that can be not just a literal drawing, but an impression you have from the drawing, from the um, text that you're reading. Okay, so then we're going to move to independent work, we, and what this is what we'd like you to do. We're going to ask you to listen to some poems to choose a poem, to listen to the poem again and read it again and create mental pictures and then go ahead and draw what comes to your mind as you're visualizing, um, using the visualizing strategy as you're reading the poem or listening to the poem. Okay, so the first one is an invitation. Let's take a trip, just you and me, through the blue and sparkling sea. I'll give you a ride upon my tail You'll see what it's like to be a whale. We'll leap and dive and chase the fish and swim and splash as long as we wish. And when we're done playing in the icy deep, we'll let the wave rock us to sleep. And then poem two is Song of Joy. The great sea has set me adrift. It moves me as the weed in a great river. Earth and the great weather move me, have carried me away, and move my inward parts with joy. And then the third choice, the mother's song. It's so still in the house. There is a calm in the house. The snowstorm wails out there, and the dogs are rolled up with their snouts under their tail. My little boy is sleeping on the ledge. On his back he lies, breathing through his mouth. His stomach is bulging round. Is it strange if I start to cry with joy? So those are the three poems, so go ahead and choose one, read it again, and then use the quick sketch method to record what you were visualizing in your mind. We'll give you about a minute. Ladies, as they're doing this, just a quick question. Can you use this at all levels? Is this K-12 or um, is it really in kind of focused on elementary? Oh, definitely K-12. In all of our workshops, we've had K-12 teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so you would just, you know, depending on the age of your students, you would pick the artwork that was appropriate for their age and also the poems as well. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure that was clear for everybody. Mm -hmm.
So as you're drawing, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the three poem choices as you're finishing up your quick sketch. Um, as you can see, just like with the artwork, um, there's some differences in the poem. Uh, the first one is it's very literal. Um, a lot of times people choose that one, which is fine. Um, and then you can see as we move over to Song of Joy and the Mother's Song, it kind of requires some different um, visualizing and interpretation skills than the, than the first poem. So we just wanted to point out, depending on your students, you can also differentiate between the poems. And the nice thing is, is that even though you're providing dif uh, differentiating uh, different poems, you're still allowing choice to let the students choose which one they want to do. So we're going to finish up and move on to our closure and um, sharing. So we would, uh, again, encourage you to post yours on Padlet. And then with students, we post them, we compare them, we do class votes on which ones go with which um, poem, and then discuss about the experience that the kids had doing this. And then again, the next step would be having students to apply the strategy by reading independently or guided reading groups. Okay, so that uh, brings us to the end of our uh, reading lesson. And, um, you know, you'll have access to this webinar, so if you want to go back and reread the poems and add more to your quick sketches before you post on Padlet, feel free. Um, but very quickly, um, before we take uh, any questions and wrap up, we just want to go through briefly the rest of our um, chapters. So we have a chapter on making connections, where we connect art to art, art to world, and then text to text, and text to world. And so we really look at how we can make connections in um, children's lives and to the world around them. Uh, we have a chapter on questioning where um, in art, the art lesson is that um, we, we teach children about how to ask rich, rich questions about artwork to help them guide and get deeper meaning into the artwork. Um, and then we do the same in reading. We teach them how to ask those deep questioning skills and strategies that help them um, kind of understand and, and get dive deeper into, into the book. Um, we have a chapter on determining importance, and we look at how do artists help the viewers determine what's important in a work of art. We talk about emphasis and focal point, um, and then in reading, how do writers help their readers determine what's important, and we talk about text features, um, and so uh, we do a little bit of comparison there. And you can see these are samples of students' work for the determining importance strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a chapter on inferring, where um, we make inferences uh, using artwork. Um, we really like to use this Picasso's uh, tragedy that you see here in the right-hand corner. Um, and we have students infer what they believe is happening. Um, and it's really interesting to hear the, the, the interesting stories that students come up with about um, the relationship of these three people and what's going on in their lives. Um, and then students get um, to create an emotion collage. So we, we try and have a little art making in each one of our lessons. And so we have students create a, um, we have them choose an emotion and create a collage based on that emotion and then have other students guess what that emotion is. Uh, and then in reading, um, they make inferences from pictures and then short sentences, and then they move to text. And then our last chapter is synthesizing, uh, where we're kind of pulling all of the information together that they've learned um, uh, to create meaning. Um, and we have them kind of combine all of the things that they've learned, and they create a story quilt. We have them read parts of text and uh, see how their um, meaning gets deeper the, the deeper they go into the text and then for the art activity they actually create a main idea kind of story quilt and then they combine those together. So at this point we'll see if there's any more uh, questions and see if we can answer any of those questions but if you want to reach us uh, this is our email addresses, and then again, uh, the link to the Padlet page, and we have a website, uh, teachreadingusingart.com, 
Uh, so feel free to contact us at any of those ways. And I'll bring us back on. Woo! You made it through. Right? <laughs> that was good. We actually have some really great questions coming in. Um, so one of them is, and I, I, I had this exact same question, do you give your students as much time as they need to quick sketch or do you finish at the time you need for the lesson? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we really want to encourage them for this to draw quickly. So if you give them a time limit and tell them at the beginning, like, we're going to give you five minutes to do this. I think we moved you all through this a little bit faster mm -hmm. than we usually would. We would, if we were doing this in a face-to-face -face training, we would probably give you five minutes to do each drawing. Um, so it's a, a little bit more time. Um, but uh, I think for this, you really don't want this to... Um, well, it could. It could draw out into several lessons, but for this purpose, we really kind of want them to move through uh, quickly and get their ideas quickly on paper. Um, mm -hmm. So five, five minutes, seven minutes, that's probably the max you would want to go. If you're trying to fit this into a 45, 50 minute, 60 minute time period, you want to make sure that you give them a limit and tell them ahead of time what that limit is and then maybe give them like a two minute warning or a one minute warning. So that they're not caught off guard. Right. So then how do you handle a student who refuses to draw? Just flat out says, nope, I'm not going to do it. That's a really good question. I think that um, I would pull that student aside. There's probably some other issues going on there. Um, see if I could kind of get at the root of what's going on. Are they having a bad day? Is this a child that... Uh, always refuses to draw in my class. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's the subject that they're drawing that um, has them scared. I think with this though, there really is no wrong answer. It isn't like we're all drawing humans and you know, oh I can't draw people. I always get that all the time. I can't draw people, you know? <laughs> and so um, with this it's really just their interpretation, you know? If they want to draw um, whatever it is that they're visualizing in their mind I think is fine and so um, so far I haven't had a child that's been apprehensive about doing this drawing activity um, but I think that you know I would try and work with that child in you know really like what's going on or what's what is the difficult part that you're having can I maybe draw an example on the side for you that you can refer to um, or what I break things down into shapes so what are the shapes if you're drawing a person where do where are we gonna start with this person what are the shapes that you need to draw so I try and kind of break things down into their simple parts before um, having them and then they can kind of construct from there Okay, so then, um, and then another question is about what kind of art teaching background did your students have at the schools where you developed your book? I think that's um, a really good question. They had art since uh, kindergarten. kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, some of them may have had, we did have pre-K mm -hmm. um, at Tacoma. Tacoma Park, so a few of them may have had the pre-K program, and we do have art for our pre-K students. Um, so if they were with us, if, if I taught them in second grade, then they had had art since at least kindergarten and possibly even pre-K. So a few years of art education. But do you feel like that's a necessity? I mean, there's people out there that they might get art once a month if they're lucky or they're teaching art on a card and they don't have those, you know, all of the resources maybe. So... Well, one of the things that we did in the book is we talked about um, how you can teach this. So if you're in a school and you're not an art educator, we've given the background of the, of the different um, art vocabulary that they could use on their own so that if you are a classroom teacher, you can teach this on your own. Or if you are a reading teacher and you didn't have, I mean, an art teacher and you didn't have a partner, you could also do the reading, reading part on your own as well. Okay, got it. 
Um, another question, when the students are drawing, this is coming from Kim, by the way. Kim is a rock star with the questions tonight. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> when, when the students are drawing and I'm walking around the room and I see someone drawing something that I can't connect with the artwork or the poem, do I say something or do I let it go? I think I would definitely let it go. Um, and then, you know, because, and we've seen this. I mean, even working with adults, mm -hmm. their interpretation might be something different. So, um, you know, I mean, of course, as long as it's appropriate, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, no, but I'm saying, you know, I, if it was really, really far off and you could really not make a connection, you, like Lisa said before, you might pull that stop child privately and have a conversation. But we do find that there's, that the, 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 as long as they can give evidence of how mm -hmm. it connects, that's what we're looking for. Especially in the poems, like the one I think it's called um, Song of Joy, it's really open-ended and they're, you know, the work that comes out of poetry is just so interesting and so different and everyone has their own interpretation and just like Jenny said, if they can provide the evidence that says, you know, this is this is what it looks like to move my inward parts with joy, you know, like I've created that's this. Big. On, that's huge. <laughs> that is huge. It's yeah. very different and every child is going to produce that in a very different way and that's what I love about um, creating work from poetry because there's just no wrong answer. Right. Well, and I love that it's the way you've establish this that it's so integrated in terms of both Common Core so you're finding evidence you know all the time we're talking about how do you find evidence well this is a beautiful way to do that mm -hmm. uh, but then also that you're integrating across arts areas because using that song lyric from Joni Mitchell I mean that uh, beautiful I just I think the way that we can connect across areas is unlimited with the way that you've set this up which is fantastic um, quick question about visual thinking strategies. So is this different than the visual thinking strategies um, that are out there from Project Zero or is it based on that and then kind of extended? How do you um, differentiate that? Yeah, I don't, I don't actually think that um, we don't reference, I can't remember if no. we actually reference um, Harvard Project Zero in our book at all, but um, we uh, they're not. That's not the same. There aren't. Those are kind of some different strategies, and and they're wonderful as well. And and I've definitely done a lot of work with the teachers that I've worked with on how to use those strategies. Mm -hmm. um, but these are these lessons are are a little different than those. And I think the connection here is that um, if you go back, you know, if you think back to the some of our beginning slides, and we're thinking that art can be the scaffold so that students can do it with text, and that's kind of a difference there too, mm -hmm. that we're focusing on the reading comprehension strategy of visualizing, but we're teaching children to do it with pictures, with artwork first, then right. moving it to applying it to the text. Got it, and I think that is a huge, that's a huge piece right there that's missing a lot of times is that the translation between the two areas and how to use that together in both areas with integrity. Yep. So, beautiful job. Um, that looks like about the time frame that we have for tonight and we've answered a lot of really good questions. So, um, thank you so much ladies for all of your work and for sharing your time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to do some quick... This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, this is wonderful. I'm going to do a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, okay. So just hang on one second. Sure. But in the meantime, um, you can get in touch with um, both Jenny and Lisa using the resource guide that we've posted. Just copy and, post, or copy and paste that link that's in the uh, chat up into your browser and you can download that if you have not already. Um, they have all of their contact information in there as well as their website and the Padlet uh, link. So feel free um, to go ahead and use that. Uh, that's included with your registration. Additionally, you're going to be receiving an email within the next 30 minutes or so with a certificate for your PD hours. If you don't receive that, 
please email me, susan at educationcloset.com, and we'll get it to you directly. That way you can get credit for this evening. Um, and additionally, I'll also send out an email tomorrow with a recap of the um, event as well as the links in case you need them one more time and where you can find the archive of this presentation. So if you want to go back and review it at any time, you can. So with that, we're going to close out tonight. Oh, uh, ladies, one last question from Teresa. Um, this is, um, let's just, she said, I do not recall how you introduced this, but is this a one-class activity, or have you used this to lead into a larger lesson project unit? Um, could see this leading into printmaking make, project very nicely. So how do, you, how do you use this specifically? Yeah, I think so far we've done this um, as kind of a, a one lesson in art and then moving into one lesson in reading. But I think it could be done multiple times throughout the year. I think the strategy of visualizing, you can keep coming back to it. And so it's not... It's, it's something that you can continually do as, you know, in, in any of your lessons. As you're starting any new lesson, you could really have students visualize um, you know, as it pertains mm -hmm. to that activity or that new lesson that you're teaching. So um, I think absolutely it can be used throughout the year. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and uh, I hope you've gotten a lot of, out of this presentation. I know I have. Thank you so much to Lisa and Jenny, and until next time, we'll catch you on the other side. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.